Good morning, um, or as we say in the Netherlands, uh, Goede morgen. Uh, this is a talk about the challenges of designing multiplayer games. Who am I? My name is uh, Tim Dongs, and uh, over the past few years I've worked on a couple of games. First in, uh, here in Norway, in Oslo, on Age of Conan, and then the Rise of the Gosley expansion. After that I moved to Canada to the new uh, Montreal office. Where, where I continued working on Conan, the free-to-play free conversion, the movie tie-in, and after that, The Secret World. And now I'm working on, uh, on Home from the Revolution, which is uh, being done by Deep Silver, Dan Buster Studios in Nottingham, UK. Who's Deep Silver? Well, most people haven't heard of it because it's a relatively new studio, but previously there were Crytek UK, and before that, Free Radical, and they worked on a Time Splitter series, Second Sight, Haze, and of course, uh, the Crisis series is part of Crytek UK. So let's start at the beginning. Games themselves, inherently they're multiplayer. I mean, any of these games, very familiar. You can't play them by yourselves. And of course, they, they date back very long. After that, we got the technology to make some early games. Even the early games were multiplayer, such as Pong, um, Galaxy and Space War, were all multiplayer games. I like this quote, it's interesting. Design is the process by which designer creates the context to be encountered by participants from which meaning emerges. This is very true in single player, but even more so in multiplayer, where there's multiple participants and they can also create meaning for other players. Like if you encounter a player in an MMO, they might attack you, which wasn't scripted by the designers, it was just something that happens, it's an emergent property of the game which makes the whole thing more interesting and more complex. Um, why multiplayer? Oh, this is something from the, the secret world where people could fight a massive multiplayer, three-sided battle and take control over the area. But why do, why do we want to make multiplayer games? They're inherently complex, they are difficult to make and there's lots of issues, technical challenges and such while making them. Why do we make them? They're very profitable and basically you extend the lifetime of the game and there's some very interesting results we get from playing these games, such as um, the forming of guilds, clans, and of course, what are people playing here? The, I walked around, they're primarily playing multiplayer games and. Not, Occasionally single player games or working on something, but it's very uh, popular. Of course, having all these players gets some nasty side effects. This is toxic players. This is actually from one of the presentations that Riot gave on League of Legends on how they deal with toxic players. And there's some very interesting stuff in there. You, can, you guys could probably look it up somewhere. But like, in this slide, they primarily said that it, it usually happens when people are having a bad day, but the problem with toxic players is that it spreads. If somebody's rude to you, you might be rude to other players as well. But they found that if they put text somewhere in red on a loading screen, be nice to players, they play better that way. It actually changes people's behavior. So what makes making multiplayer games difficult? Well, players. It seems obvious, but I'll go into the more details later. I, I figured I, I could split them up in different kinds of challenges. There's the basic design challenges, there's narrative challenges, and technological challenges to make it all work. And what do, you, what do I mean by these? For example, design challenges, uh, the amount of players, where are the players? Um, it, when you make an MMO, you have to make something that works from one player to 50 players. You have no idea how many players are going to be, where they're going to be. Uh, if you want to do a cutscene, do they all need to be there? Are you going to force this cutscene on players, even though they're not there, should they be in the cutscene? Uh, whenever this player is uh, dealing with other players, they could be rude, they could just gank players, they could make sure they can't get a quest that they need to get. If we all have this working, how do we reward this? Like, 
you shouldn't get the best sword at the beginning of the game, but when should you get it? What is the best sword? And of course, if you were making competitive multiplayer, how do you balance this? It's not fun to get killed by somebody that has much better gear than you, is much more experienced. A bunch of these are their own topic. You could have an entire lecture on any of these. Of course, um, narrative challenges. A lot of uh, everyone is in single player is used to being the main protagonist of a story. The story is about you. A lot of games are all about the hero's journey. Luke Skywalker beco becoming a Jedi Knight. However, are we going to do that in a multiplayer game? Is everyone going to be? Is it all going to be about them? Are you the? Is it, it doesn't make sense if you just kill the, um, an important boss and then you're asked to, to milk some cows. Like, it, it doesn't make sense, it's, it's difficult. Of course, we could uh, try to do it uh, procedurally, but if you get something like Im emergent narrative, computers don't know what makes a good story. Writers generally can't program either, so it's just tricky to make make emergent narrative good and actually have the emotion that a properly written story has. And of course, there's user-generated content. I don't know, a whole bunch of gamers have been trying this, like Neverwinter Nights, um, a bunch of others, it doesn't really matter, but it's, th that one is tricky. Like how a lot of the stuff that people make is not of good quality, unfortunately. It would be nice if everyone could make great games, but it's hard and therefore we want to filter what they make and actually let players play the cool stuff. But that requires an entire system of filtering and actually making that work. Of course, technological, uh, there's techn technological challenges as well, such as matchmaking. How Besides the, 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 the fact how you're actually going to match people together, how strong is a player, how do you calculate player skill, that's as much as a design challenge as a technical challenge, but then you actually need to put them together as well. Do I want my game to be client-server? Do I want it to make it peer-to-peer? -peer? Well, client-server is expensive. You need to host it. But at the same time, we cannot trust the client. It's like the first thing you learn. People hack their clients. They manipulate content. So it seems like a logical choice, but OK, you're, you're told we don't have the resources to actually do a client-server. Let's make it peer-to-peer. Yeah, let's make the player host the game that we can trust. Great. What if a player disconnects while hosting a game? There's the whole host migration stuff. Of course, when we make a new game, you have to make sure people can actually get in the game. The servers are not overloaded. These days, it's easier when you can just pop another instance on Amazon and any of the cloud things. And as a designer, you also have to be aware of technical limitations. What can your engine do. Nothing can do everything, but you have to work within these constraints. For example, uh, some of the technical challenges. Um, in Conan, we had sieges. Uh, basically, two guilds could attack each other, and this was up to 48 players each. So there were 96 players on each side. A lot of it, the base rules were all written in code, but they wanted to expose it to the designers, give them the power to change the rules and make sieges more interesting. For example, uh, what, if I, what if I want a giant raid boss to defend my keep? I could just add it in the script. It was made in this. It's a visual scripting language called Scry. It's like Kismet and Flowgraph. It's similar. Each of these nodes is a single command, but you could also do some interesting loops and logic. However, it has some interesting constraints. For example, uh, it runs at 20 frames a second on the server, if the server is actually running fast enough. And it can only run a 1,000 commands a frame. Now, if you have 96 players, that doesn't leave a lot of commands for each player. So what happens if it, if it exceeds these commands? Initially, your script just got killed. Oh, yeah, your seats no longer work. I'm sorry. So the script got killed, so we had to actually make it yield properly and get some basic logic in there. Of course, it makes sense for the majority of the script. We don't want infinite loops in there, but it was a big problem for when we were doing sieges. But um, as I moved on, I, I moved to code, so I had to write some guidelines for the rest of the designers on how do you make proper competitive multiplayer content. So I, I came up with some base rules. 
that was good to keep in mind. So when players are dealing with other players, they can and will always affect the content if you let them. For example, in Age of Conan, there were no sides. You could just fight whoever, as long as they weren't part of your group or your guild. So what happened once they added multiplayer progression? Yeah, there were fight clubs. We were just standing near a section pad, beating each other's head and getting experience for doing it. So how do we avoid that? Some of these things can't really be avoided. You just have to keep it in mind when you design these things. Secondly, play, uh, you want to make sure the players remain um, competitive. You can't give the strongest player the best gear, even though that's traditionally what we do. So what, what does that mean? Uh, the stronger players are going, just going to get stronger, and as you start, you have to die before you can even get um, anywhere. This was, to me as a player, this is a big issue with the WoW arenas, and it's, it's frustrating to have to just grind your way to get to a base competitive level. And third, is it appealing to the player? I specifically used the word appealing and not is it fun because not everything has to be fun. We don't watch movies because they're fun. Watching Schindler's List is not fun, but it is appealing. <laughs> Just a, a slight detail about <laughs> games not having to be fun. <laughs> well, modern MMOs are starting to become more and more like single-player games. Like we, There's a lot of mechanics in there that are there to serve as the player and make it... Um, Make it more convenient, such as fast travel, we instant, so we don't have the, the player to uh, deal with other players. Uh, they can have a, a very, uh, a very much set story because we know exactly where they're going to be, which is fun. It makes a more co coherent experience. But a lot of these things, especially Dungeon Finder, the Auction House, and Crossover Battlegrounds, means it makes it actually harder to meet new people, and meeting new people is hard. So why are we doing these things? Why, uh, the, the reason that people play multiplayer games is to play with others, but MMOs are just turning into more single-player games by the day. Then again, more single-player games are turning more into MMOs, so I guess we'll find a nice balance somewhere. We did do some interesting things on the secret world that was different from uh, most MMOs there. For example, with classes, character progression, you didn't have to start the game. Oh, I want, you need to pick a class. I don't know what each of these classes do. So why are you answering me this? A limited quest journal. When somebody told me th uh, this stuff, uh, some, when somebody told me we're going to limit the amount of quests, as in most MMOs allow you to carry uh, 40 quests. In a secret world, it's five. And the, a specific kind, you only can have one main story quest, one investigation, three side quests, if I remember correctly. There, there is an entire episode of Extra Credits about this and how well it worked because we forced people to go around, go through the world, meet new people in the process. Investigation missions were also interesting. Basically, you, you could get a quest and they will give you some hints and they might actually get you to Google stuff, uh, run around, investigate the world, and actually learn more about the law in general and um, learn more about history. We even have fake websites that you could hack, like you could kill somebody, get its badge, and then you could log into this website that wasn't of a fake company and get some info that you couldn't get otherwise. It was interesting, and players liked that. But in pretty much any game these days, we want to reward the player for what they're doing. But this is kind of weird. Like Back in the days, this is the original Unreal Tournament. Uh, just killing somebody was its own reward. Getting a headshot, getting them, uh, all these messages, how are you doing? Godlike. It was, that was a reward for it itself. But now games are turning more into this. This is Borderlands 2. Like, oh, it's all about getting more loot, more progression. And what, Why are we doing this? It's just shooting somebody in the face is inherently fun, but now you can do it with more people and it's mostly about getting the loot. But what happens if you already got all the best stuff? It actually has some interesting side effects. So what do we usually give to the player? Like equipment, weapons, armor, power increases. Um, you know, stronger, you can do more damage just because you leveled up. New abilities, which 
this one isn't that too bad because it's good to not give players something right at the start so they can actually slowly learn the game. Paths and new locations. Well, new locations kind of ties into it, power increase. You can now go to this raid because you're strong enough to actually fight this boss rather than being able to go there right away. Uh, at GDC, there was an interesting talk about this and what motivates people. And I, I, I've some started using this in some of the re rewards I give out. Basically, we've got two kinds of motivations. Intrinsic motivation. You do it because it's fun, you like it. And as it says, it, it, it is stuff like interest, autonomy, even relatedness. You, like, you play with other people because you enjoy playing with other people, not because you're forced to do it. Extrinsic is specifically about the rewards, pressure to perform, getting grades in school. But the way that we reward uh, people in games now is really weird because if we would do it in real life, people would be like, why are we doing this? For example, um, Let's say you take your girlfriend out on a date. You go to the cinema, have a fun time, go for dinner. After you get home, you then give her money. Thank you for coming out with me. It's some money. They're like, what? Why are you giving me money? It's exactly what we're doing in games. It was fun by itself, and now you kind of take the fun away because there's an extrinsic reward associated with this. Next time you do it, people expect money. There's been a lot of tests uh, on how the brain reacts to this. They did tests with uh, two groups, one group, they gave a reward after performing a test. They didn't tell them it was going to be, but they, they thought, cool, we get a reward. There's a, a good amount of brain activity. The other group just did it because they were told to. Uh, next time, they gave the first group, they had to do the same test. No, they couldn't care less. They didn't like the activity at all, simply because the reward was taken away. <sighs> How should we do it? In WoW, there was this interesting thing called the Meccano Arc. Most games these days are not about grinding. Like, oh, grinding is bad. Why do we force people to grind? Th this thing, on the other hand, is completely optional. Yes, it's a bit of a grind to get it. You have to get your engineering up, get all the resources required. But then, once you get it, it actually it feels very rewarding for the player. They now have more autonomy. They can go places they couldn't go before. They c you can bring your friend on it so they feel more related to the friends. Um, it increases their mastery because they can go around the battlegrounds faster. And as I said, it's completely optional. A more recent example is uh, Bloodborne. I'm not sure if anyone played it here, but it came out last week from the creators of Dark Souls and Demon Souls. Um, there's a lot of explanation for the player. The, the game doesn't explain anything. Yeah, here's a well, go do your thing. There might be some hints around the way, but basically I had no idea what the fuck I was doing. Of course, it's very hard, so you, you get rewarded for your mastery. It's the whole idea behind the game. You have a great deal of autonomy because the game doesn't really tell you to do anything. You, you can go and fight whatever you want to fight. So all the progression mechanics in this game are there to extend what's there. You, you don't have to progress if you don't want to. You could just immediately walk to the boss and try to fight him. But it's recommended that you do because it makes it somewhat easier. And of course, the equipment ties into that as well. So once we, oh, and um, it is a multiplayer game and the multiplayer is completely optional. So. The players get a choice, do I want to play cooperatively with friends or not? So when we're actually making some multiplayer, it's very important to test. While it seems obvious, it's way more difficult to test. I, at Funcom, at some point, I had four PCs just to be able to test something. <laughs> because the, the risk is if you don't actually test it with multiple clients, you get all these fun bugs, replication issues. Uh, it, this worked when I did with one player, yes, but the moment multiple players come, weird stuff happens. So you want, you, when possible, you want to arrange proper play tests with friends, colleagues. Do proper stress testing. It's something I couldn't do in Age of Conan, but we finally got in uh, the secret world. Just spawn in a lot of NPCs and see if the server can cope with it. Bots also help, just getting some AI to roam around, do some basic stuff makes it much easier. 
And of course, focus testing. Get somebody who has no idea about your game, get them to play it and see what it's like. If they enjoy it, maybe they will have some interesting tips for you. Of course, making tutorials for a multiplayer game is much more difficult. Most games these days pause the game, big pop-up. Oh, did you know you could do this? Uh, Yes, please don't pause the game, especially since the, most of them are not contextual. They just show you all the basic stuff, even though you already have used it. So, especially in games that uh, have single player and multiplayer, we cannot assume that they actually play the single player. Like, would make sense. That's where all, by default, all the loading screens, uh, all the tutorial tips are. But People are going to jump into multiplayer right away because that's either the part they care about or maybe they have a friend pushing themselves. So how can we actually add proper tutorials then on um, multiplayer games? Well, of course, there's the loading screen hints, which is something that Bloodborne is very much missing. All it has is the name. It's, it doesn't tell me anything. I already know the name of this game that I bought. Of course, um, we could also add contextual tutorials. Uh, Plants vs. Zombies is a good example for this. Like, for me, it is one of the best games that, uh, that does tutorials well. A lot of game, uh, people don't really realize it has tutorials, but if you actually plant something on the right of the screen, it will actually give you a tip. Yeah, maybe you should put them closer to the back rather than here. So they only really pop up if it's relevant. Gameplay driven tips. Um, it's Basically, um, you could get AI to say, oh, go attack that thing. It's very much something that Gears of War did. Uh, jump over this, go kill that. And of course, MMOs like uh, quests and missions. If the player doesn't know where they need to go, we can just say, oh, there's a new quest in this location, go over there. And of course, uh, quests and missions also have the nice benefit that they have a bunch of text that the player can read if they want to, in where you can actually explain something. Of course, modern games are expensive to make, which is why a lot of them have microtransactions and DLC, which both of them sound so negative, but then again, a lot of these are not great. When you add uh, microtransactions, the, the immediate concern is stuff like pay to win. Um, a different issue is uh, something called supremacy goods. And supremacy good is a good that diminishes the value of all things around in its own space, including itself. And a good example for that is, um, let's say you have a ski resort, and one day you decide, uh, I'm going to make a new ski pass. And this ski pass means I have exclusive rights to this one ski slope. Nobody else can use it, which then means that it lowers the value of all the regular ski passes by itself. And maybe you decide to sell more of these. So now two ski slopes are not available for, to the public, but then again, now they feel that their, their ski, uh, ski pass is worth less as well because they had exclusive rights and now they no longer do. And in games, this could be something like you can have an insanely powerful weapon that you need to buy that's really expensive, but the moment other people have it, it kind of loses its value because you're not the only one with it anymore. Of course, there's issues like on-disc DLC and day one DLC, which is more of a problem with the actual development process. Games in general are so complex that uh, different professions finish at a different time, so artists are generally done before design is done and code usually finished last. So what do they work on? Generally DLC, but if you put something on disc and then try to sell it, players are not happy. You can have day one DLC as long as it's free, but if you force people to buy it, it's probably not the best. Exclusive content is interesting, especially for uh, competitive multiplayer. This new map pack, suddenly you're segregating your player base. Oh, they're only playing the new maps now and nobody's doing the old stuff. I cannot find a game on the old stuff. Now you're forcing me to go there. And of course, um, as, as I said uh, before, most microtransactions are kind of an afterthought. They, f they feel tacked on. And if you design your game with the, them in mind, it's going to feel much better. It's, it's not all bad. I mean... Uh, Mass Effect did a great job with it. Their, 
they, they had microtransactions, but they also had completely free multiplayer updates. Guess what funded the multiplayer updates? It was exactly those microtransactions. So, which is a great way of doing it. And uh, of course, the model that they used is really no different from what Magic the Gathering uses. The actual term is called reincurring compulsion loops. Opening new cards is fun. In that case, it was goody crazy. You never know what you're going to get, but you've got this nice presentation of, this is the stuff I, I got. And it feels awesome. I think, personally, in, when we converted Age of Conan to um, be free to play, it, was, it went actually quite well. There was a bit of an outrage when I decided to make certain PvP items available in the store. Oh, this is pay to win, but it was the lowest tier, and the whole idea behind this was, oh, players that buy this will be competitive sooner than just having to earn this. So it doesn't really give them advantage. It's still weaker than anything you can get in the game. There was a big outrage on the forums, but um, it, sold, it was the most sold item after launch, I guess. They liked it somehow. But what can we learn from um, Mass Effect? Just because something you can sell, uh, so sell something means you should. If you can give it for free, players are going to love you for it. And um, when you're making a game and you don't know if it's going to have microtransactions, which it, it doesn't really matter if you're working for a big company or an indie game. If you're not sure, assume you will, because having to add it in the end is going to be a pain in the ass and not work as well as you hope it will. Of course, um, when we're playing uh, multiplayer games, we have cheating. Well, I guess back in the days it was more like this, and they can police themselves and it's all good. But when you're um, playing online, cheating is more of an issue. So what should we do about cheating? Do we really care? Well, I guess it depends on the game. Of course, in esports, we really do care, but the esports themselves can deal with that. Should we deal with it? There's a lot of games that deal with it in their own ways. For example, uh, doing matchmaking. Oh, I know you cheated. Now I'm going to matchmake you with other cheaters. And the rest is completely invisible to the players. They just only be playing with other cheaters in their own little cesspool of evil. Um, of course, we could ban them, but that means they'll buy another copy. I guess that's good for the game developers, but they'll just do the same thing all over again. Uh, it's basically something you cannot avoid. Players will cheat. You can put as much money in it as you want. They will cheat. It just takes longer. It doesn't need to be a problem, but it's just, it's just something you need to be aware of. That they will cheat. <laughs> so some general design tips for, m for making multiplayer games is prototype everything. Don't um, underestimate the value of just simply paper prototyping something. Uh, for Age of Conan, I actually made a paper prototype version, basically converting the real-time rules to a turn-based system and then got uh, my team to play it. And I picked this one encounter from our expansion that I didn't like. I didn't tell them what it was. It's just, this is something from the game. Play it and see what you think about this. Not long after that, they decided to change the encounter. Instead of telling them that I didn't like it, uh, go play this. It's cool. Uh, OK, we're changing it. It's cool. Uh, make a list of be be uh, best practices and standards. For example, the um, sky limitation. I was talking about 1,000 commands in one frame. Make a list of bad practice saying we should do this. So me and the guy that was looking for the raids basically had specific scripts that would yield the script after it has done a certain amount of work. And this was standard and everywhere, and everyone knew how to find it. It's good to just um, write something down and so your colleagues can see why you did something. Which ties into the next point, document everything, especially when you're working on MMOs. The, there's MMOs that are old. <laughs> EverQuest, uh, what? It was released in 99. If somebody made the decision that it should work this way, they're most likely not even with the company anymore. Anarchy Online is really old as well, and you have the same problems. Okay, why? what was this person thinking when they did this? This is stupid. Write it down why it was done. There might be, have been a very good reason to do this. Of course, um, do not overcomplicate things. 
we had this um, simple script. Well, from the name, it sounds simple. It was um, basically a, a pickup item script for a quest. But it, somebody decided to extend it to be the Swiss Army knife of scripts. Uh, pick items, spawn monsters once you pick up the item, uh, spawn some particles, uh, play some music. It did all kinds of things. It became so over overcomplicated, there was no way to even fix it. Why is it even so complicated? These could just be different scripts, and you could just call them from another script. Every, pretty much every scripting language these days is completely modular, so you could just say, oh, I want these Lego pieces, tie them together in this way, and it works. And then you could just debug these things separately. Of course, um, as a designer, you want to play other games. That doesn't mean just copy what you see. Just blindly copying is always bad. You realize why they did something. Why is this good? Why is this why is this so compelling to me? What, what were they thinking when they did this? How could I improve on it and then go from there? Of course, when you design a multiplayer game, you want to allocate resources appropriately. They're difficult and hard. You need to make sure they can actually get done in time and actually have the resources they need. On Age of Conan, for some reason, we focused on the beginning part of the game which was nice and polished, and then once players got to a certain area of the game, then the content became less. And, but wait, players are starting the game, they level up. Where will they be spending most of the content? Not at the starting point of the game. They will level up and spend most of the time at the end. Why were we not? Why weren't we using most um, of the resources at the end? On raids, PvP, sieges. Once you do have something that works, you want to actually look at getting feedback, peer reviews. Feedback is interesting. People generally don't like to hear that their stuff is not fun. So be polite and tell them nicely that, oh, it's good. You could improve it this way. Of course, you want to uh, test your game and play a game. I, I, I said this separately because testing is just seeing if it, if it works, really. Does it work? If not, fix it. Playing a game, you need to sit back and see from a player's point of view. Is, does this make sense to me if I don't know what I'm doing? I, is this fun? Should we change it? And the, the last point is something that um, really happens a lot to me uh, these days because I'm mentoring uh, a bunch of juniors in my studio. And they come up with some, uh, some questions. And I don't know. If, I don't have all the answers either. I try to, but. If you don't know something, don't answer stuff immediately. Like, it's perfectly valid to just say, I don't know this, but I will find out. And uh, personally, I find that um, if you have a big problem that you don't know how to handle, s uh, take a break, split it up in each individual component, and then see how to tackle all of those, and it becomes much easier. For example, in Age of Conan, we had uh, a problem uh, with combo skipping. Age of Conan had combo, so basically, you did a couple of attacks, and then once you did them in a certain order, then you do a big attack and lots of damage and decapitations and all this stuff. But the problem was um, the animations. This entire system was driven by animation, so animation length actually dictated how much damage something would do. Not only that, um, there was some time leading up. You started swinging your sword. Then you did your damage, but usually after that, there was a whole bunch of fluff. Where you're doing, well, it's just visual fluff. But damage is calculated on the whole animation. So what does that mean? That stuff players could actually skip, and this depended on their classes, but certain classes basically could interrupt their com uh, combo right after they did their damage and did, uh, do six seconds worth of damage in three seconds. OK. This is a problem. So for a while, the people saying, oh, we should fix this. How should we fix it? Should we prevent them from doing it? Is it fun to just stand there for three seconds, just swinging your sword in the air, doing nothing? So at some point, I had a discussion with the rest of the system team. Why is this really a problem, besides the obvious damage balance issues? Like, why should we fix? Why should we prevent them from combo skipping? And once you start realizing that, uh, OK, it's not actually the fact that they're combo skipping, but the fact that it gives them an unfair advantage is the problem, means you can tackle it differently. So what we did for this specific example was um, 
we eliminated a lot of the extra time in between all the fluff and we could actually normalize the damage properly. So it, there was no longer three seconds worth of death space after doing an animation. But they could still combo skip and all classes could pretty much do it in the same way. We didn't fix combo skip, we just made, turned it into a feature instead which players liked and it, it's just a different way of tackling certain problems. This is actually something I made when people ask me, like, how d does one design a battleground? Like, wh where do you start? What do I want to do? Do I want to make something where you race the players to the end? So what I did was I basically cre uh, created a list of verbs that describe mechanics, tied in your uh, our existing mini games at the time, which was capture the flag, annihilate opposing team, and conquest, which I had done just made, and tied in the real life example. Since we were in North America, American football is a good example. So let's say if you have a base to capture the flag, our capture the flag wasn't really too different of, from what you would find in Unreal Tournament any of those types of games, but basically what does the player do in this game? They're, well, they kill stuff. They interact with stuff. Either it's by running over the flag, or in our case it was specifically yeah, to interact with the flag to pick it up. Then you have to retrieve it. Um, of course you want to protect the flag carrier, and for the other team they want to ambush the flag carrier. So it's, it's just um, putting it down in very simple pieces. So once we want to make a new mini game, we can just say, okay, I want to have something where I sacrifice a player and then race the other team to the end. And I don't know you could just mix and match these, and you could basically come up with a new, interesting type of game very quickly. Anyway, <laughs> multiplayer games—they're difficult to make. They are hard to debug. How do you decide? Why do we do it? Well, just look around you. Everyone here is playing now. It's so inspiring to just walk around here and see people actually playing some of the stuff I've worked on or other games my company has made. It's great. Anyway, does anyone have any questions about this? Anyone? Yes. Uh, so the the last slide with all the verbs, what was it for? Is that a question? It, w it was basically for me to explain to my colleagues an easy way to come up with a new game mechanic, new. You know, in this particular case, it was a new battleground. Now, it, it, I guess it's basically uh, my way of co uh, explaining to them how to design something from top down rather than bottom up. Oh, I want to have this boss that does all these mechanics. Now you can just start start very broad. Okay, I want uh, I want a fight where the player avoids a huge explosion. So we want some sort of movement mechanic. I just try to get it down to its core, and then you can easily mix and match. Uh, mix and match those for something that works for you. Like, you can tie in all kind of real life examples. I just try to make it simple and try to fi actually try to find what's the optimum amount of mechanics that uh, is good for a mini game that doesn't get get too complicated. Does it answer your question? Anyone else? Don't be shy. I'm the one standing up here. Come on. Well, otherwise, uh, you could always uh, pop by my desk. I'm sitting right there by the flag. It meshes with my cape. I'm one of the mentors here. So if anyone has any multiplayer related... Oh, yeah, yeah. One question. Uh, one question. Oh, uh, my, oh, what, oh, so, okay, so my, the question is, what is my comment on games like? Well, I guess the, your question is, oh, like multiplayer sandboxy games. Well, the game I'm working on is a sandboxy game. Uh, uh, well, 
I, I guess for, for me, I find it very interesting because um, in games like DayZ, there's a lot of uh, emergent properties. Like as a designer, you say, oh, I want the players to be able to do this. But then they go and do something completely different. Like, um, for example, one of the most famous MMO examples of emergent gameplay was in WoW, where it was, it was this raid boss that had this disease that spread. And then people brought it to the hub, and it spread all over the world, and corpses are everywhere. And now people are actually using this model to see how disease spreads, because there are those assholes that know, oh, I'm infected, I'm going to die. Oh, fuck you, I'm going to just go there and infect everyone else. So how does this tie into Rust? And they have their own little things. What happens with the zombie outbreak? I guess some of it you can see it's, it shows like uh, The Walking Dead. People will get their own groups, steal resources from each other. I love this emergent gameplay stuff. And we, I'm actually trying to design stuff with these emergent properties in mind, give players the tools, and then they can make their own game, write their own story. And this is far more memorable than most of the stories we, we make. Um, my friends are still talking about stuff they did 15 years ago in EverQuest, not because somebody decided to design this, but it's mostly stuff that they did. We made our own, um, we kind of made our own governments, our own rule sets of engaging these bosses. Nobody said we should do this. But they're probably still using them to this day. Yeah, we just, we, sh we wanted to take turns on this boss because we couldn't compete with the unemployed people. But now they're just being friendly taking each other. Really? As I tell my friends, I had this some of my, my best PvP in EverQuest on a PvE server simply because it was the interaction with the players rather than the direct killing. It's like indirect PvP, I guess. Anyway, I, I got distracted, but <laughs> does that answer your question? <laughs> Anyone else? Nobody? Yes. Let's do it. Oh, this is, okay, I'll get you next. <laughs> Uh, wh so, what are my solutions and experiences, ex experiences balancing single player and multiplayer? Well, it's actually so, uh, it's, it's been an issue in Homefront because it has single player and multiplayer. My my suggestion that I tell my colleagues is don't balance them d differently because we're making a co-op game. Why should it? Why should something that the players know from single player be three times as hard as multiplayer? I realize this now more players, but we could just change what shows up instead. Okay, instead by either increasing the numbers or increasing the difficulty, like maybe you encounter the more difficult units more often than you would in single player. And of course it ties into how much resources they have. And this, is, this question is its own presentation by, by so I can talk to you about this later if you pop by, it's fine. Anyway, your question. How do I address feature creep? That's proper planning for you. <laughs> uh, feature creep, yeah, it's very difficult, but at some point you, you cannot add new stuff. It's, it, I, I guess the interesting that one there is MMOs where the game is never really done and you'll just keep adding more stuff on top of it, but at some point you just have to kick something out of the door and in modern games we could tweak it later, it's fine. Just give something that's good, not buggy, but we can expand on it later. Feature creep is a problem, but if you keep adding features to the game, your game will never get done. And this is, I guess, the producer's job. Uh, no, you can't do this. Not because the feature sucks, but there's no time. Anyway, it's that. We can discuss this as well, <laughs> if you really want. Anyone else? No? Anyway, if you're looking for me, yellow flags, and we have capes. Come pop by. Thank you, guys. Oh, and I have some useful links on these subjects. Um, Gamma Sutra is a good uh, games industry related website. Uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, GDC Vault is actually where you can find a lot of these types of talks. Most of them are locked behind the subscription, but there's, they, they keep releasing free ones as well, and they're very worth watching.
of course, if you want to try any multiplayer stuff, I highly recommend you download the Unreal Engine because it's free and it's completely open source and it supports multiplayer. You don't need to know programming. We can, you can just do it completely in blueprints. I'll probably go into this later in the week as part of the Unreal Workshop. Uh, GameDev.net is kind of like Gamma Sutra. Industry people post there as well, but it's kind of a lower entry barrier, so they're more free about what they post. And of course, extra credits, they cover a whole range of topics. I used to like to l just link these to my colleagues as it meant I didn't have to explain something like, oh, just watch this. There's pretty pictures and they do a really good uh, job explaining uh, something. Anyway, thank you guys for coming.